why do I have so many compressors? You know, I'm just going through my uh, my plugins here, and I went through a phase where I was buying a lot of different plugin bundles and things like that, and somehow I've ended up with like 30 different compressor plugins. Uh, if you're new to mixing, compression can be really confusing, as simple as the concept may be. You know, you play around with some knobs, and you're not really quite sure what you're hearing. You've got you know, very moot compressors, you've got FET, you've got VCA, you've got optical. Is this all just alphabet soup to you? If you need help sorting through your compressor plugins, then join me for this episode of I Don't Have a Band, right now. Hey there, I'm Dan, the self-proclaimed Lonely Rocker. Welcome to this episode of I Don't Have a Band. This is the series devoted to the home studio enthusiast and the home recording musician with videos really aimed at helping making your home studio life better. So thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be taking a look at compression, specifically compression plugins. Uh, your DAW probably came bundled with a, a whole bunch of different types. Like I'm looking at this uh, compressor, the uh, the basic compressor that comes with Logic Pro. You got Platinum Digital, Studio VCA, FET, Opto. What does this all mean? If you're new to mixing, compression is one of those mysteries. But next to an EQ, compression is one of the most important plugins or tools that you use to help you get really good mixes. The key is to really understanding what a compressor is doing and what type of compressor to use for what role. So let's start with the basics of compressors. A compressor is a tool designed to control the dynamics of a signal. Now, what does that mean? Dynamics is simply the difference between the lowest volume and the loudest volume in a signal, and that distance between the two. So a compressor aims to sort of bring those two volumes closer together. Now, let's use my voice as an example. You know, my voice goes up and then my voice gets a little quieter. My voice gets louder again and then gets a little quieter. Now, imagine you wanted to mix my voice into a program that's got music and sound effects, and you're really fighting these volumes. You know, you bring my volume up for the lowest volumes, but my, my my loudest volumes get too loud, and then you bring the loudest ones down, and the lowest ones are too low. I mean, you can ride uh, your, your fader with some automation, but uh, that's just going to be really complicated, and you're not going to get the desired results. So a compressor can step in and close the gap between that range and volumes. So I've got a little visual example for you. I've got this sponge, a little plastic cup, toilet paper roll, and a straw. Now let's take a look at this sponge. This sponge represents our sound. Now if we can look at it, uh, let's say the yellow part of the sponge is our loudest volumes, the blue is our quietest volumes, and that dynamic range that I talked about is really the distance between the loudest and the quietest volumes. That's our dynamic range. Now this plastic cup is going to take on the role of the compressor. So the idea is, is we want to take our sponge, which represents our sound, and we want to get it in the cup. Now if we just try to put it in straight, well, it doesn't fit. So what are we going to do to get this sponge into this cup? Well, if we squeeze it a little bit, squeeze, compress, we can, we can squeeze it in there. And there you go. So we've had to squeeze this sponge a little bit to get it inside the cup. That's compression. Now, if you look at the sponge, the end result, you know, we've rounded the corners a little bit, you know, just we've got it in there and we haven't really mangled the sponge all that much. It still pretty much looked like it did when we started. Maybe just a, like I said, a, a little squeeze around the edges and that's it. But really, it's, it's really recognizable to where it started. Now, imagine we took this same sponge, we've got this toilet paper roll, and now we want to squeeze this thing into this toilet paper roll. Well, there's a lot more squeezing involved to get it inside of here. And even further, if we wanted to take the sponge and squeeze it into this straw, you can imagine the amount of squeezing and how different this sponge is going to look once it gets inside of that straw. That's a lot of compression. Now your sound operates much the same way. The idea is to take a sound and squeeze it into a space that's a bit smaller than when it started. And really the decision about what type of compressor to use and what amount of compression we want to use comes down to what we want this thing to look like once it gets through that compressor. As this is a basic lesson, I don't want to get too deep into the science of compressors, but different compressors achieve their compression very differently, giving them all different sounds, which ultimately determines what type of compressor works best when. And this is where a lot of novice mixers get stuck. On some compressors, the parameters are predefined by the unit, while others there's a lot more control. But there are some basic settings on a compressor that we need to understand to really understand compression. Let's take a look at those. Input gain controls the volume of the signal coming into the plugin, and output gain controls the volume of the compressed signal on the way out of the plugin. Threshold is simply the level when the compressor kicks in to do its job. So, for example, let's say we set a threshold at minus 10 decibels. Anything below minus 10 is just going to pass on through unaffected, but any of the sounds that go above minus 10 are going to be affected by the compressor based on certain parameters that we'll discuss in a moment. 
The attack is simply how fast the compressor kicks in. Now think of a snare drum. You've got the initial whack and you've got the tail that follows afterwards. If you set a really fast attack, you can get the compressor to grab onto that initial whack, or you can delay the attack a little bit to let the whack go through and have the compression affect the tail that happens afterwards. So we've determined when the compressor kicks in and how fast it kicks in. Now we want to determine how much gain reduction or how much we want to lower the volumes of any of the signals that are above the threshold. This is determined by a ratio like two to one or three to one. One to one means no reduction, do nothing. Two to one will reduce the gain of all frequencies above the threshold by half. So if our threshold is set to zero decibels and a frequency spikes to four decibels, it will be reduced by two decibels above the threshold. If our spikes hit six decibels, it will reduce those to three decibels above the threshold. A zero dB threshold with a ratio set to three to one will take a nine decibel frequency and reduce it to three decibels over the threshold. The idea is not to reduce all of the levels below the threshold. That's called limiting and a topic for another day. The threshold is a guide and the ratio simply calculates how much to reduce the frequencies by. Remember, the more you compress the signal, the more you alter its properties. Think about our sponge and shoving it through a straw. So now the compressor has done its job. Do we want it to hold on forever? No, eventually we want it to let go so it can get back to square one and start its task all over again. This is called the release. This determines how long the compressor holds on to a signal as it approaches the threshold before it lets go and starts all over again. This is a fine tune adjustment and you'll understand it more the more you practice and understand exactly what it's doing and how it affects your signal. But the attack and release work very closely together determining how natural or unnatural the compression sounds. If the release time is too short, you can get kind of a pumping effect, especially if you have very fast attack speeds. Uh, consequently, if your release time is too long, it can take too long for that compressor to recover and it can miss some of the frequencies coming back in on the other end. And some compressors will have makeup gain. This allows you to compensate for any gain loss during the process of compression. So natural or unnatural, neither is wrong with a compressor. It all comes down to what you're trying to do with your signal. So the first consideration when choosing a compressor type is if you want something more transparent or something that's going to add some more coloration. By definition, transparent is something that light can pass through. Think of a window. We're aware of its presence, but light can pass right through it. A transparent compressor is designed to do its job with minimal changes to the original signal. Again, remember our sponge. Other compressors by design are a lot less transparent and add some coloration, warmth, or distortion to a signal. These types of compressors add creativity to the role of the compressor. Think of pumping drums or a fat distorted bass guitar. You would use these kind of compressors if you're looking to make some creative changes to the signal in addition to controlling their dynamics. I don't want to get deep into the technology of each compressor. I just want to take you through the four main categories of compressors just to give you an idea of the differences and when you might use each one. Verimu or tube compressors are vintage compressors that used vacuum tubes in their circuitry. They tend to have slower attack and release times, giving you a vintage coloration not achievable by other types of compressors. They are very reactive to the material fed into them and deliver a lot of warm and creamy results. Controls on tube compressors are often limited as the attack, release, and ratio are determined by the unit itself, sometimes with basic control settings. Some can be used on your master bus if you're looking for a more musical response as opposed to a more precise compression like a VCA delivers. We'll discuss that in a moment. However, tube compressors are known for adding warmth and coloration and are great for vocals. I particularly like tube compressors on bass guitar, but you can try them on any instrument where you want to add some warmth and saturation. Some good examples of tube compressor plugins are the Fairchild 660 and 670 emulated by Waves and UAD, the Klanghelm MJUC, and United Plugins Royal Compressor. A VCA or voltage control amplifier is arguably the most common type of compressor. They are typically fast and punchy and find many uses. Also, while VCAs can get aggressive when pushed, they tend to be more transparent, adding less coloration to a signal, making them ideal for master bus compression. VCAs are most often associated with some of the biggest names like API, Neve, and SSL. Most VCA compressors give you more control, so they're useful in a ton of applications when you want more precise control of the compressor. VCA compressors are great for guitars, basses, drums, even vocals, and especially your master bus. A few examples of VCA compressor plugins are the Waves SSLG Master Bus Compressor, Brainworks' Townhouse Bus Compressor, which is based on the SSL, Focusrite's RED3, and the Waves DBX160. Next, we've got FET compressors. FET stands for Field Effect Transistor. These compressors saw transistors replacing tubes. Many often wonder what the differences are between VCAs and FETs. 
Technology aside, FET compressors have really fast attack times and tend to add more color, so you would typically avoid using them on your master bus. FET compressors are fast, clean, and predictable and are ideal for vocals, bass, guitar, and others where you need reliable compression and a touch of color. The most famous FET compressor is the 1176, emulated many times over in hardware and plug-in form. These are great for guitars and drums. Some plug-in examples would be the Wave CLA-76, UA's 1176, and the Slate FG-116. Optical compressors have an interesting yet imperfect science behind them, where sound moves current, triggers a light which triggers a resistor that controls the compression. Too much science for this video, but this imperfect method of compression can deliver some really musical results as the compressor is very reactive to the material it's fed, in a very different way than a tube compressor reacts. In simple terms, an optical compressor is less predictable but delivers very smooth and musical results. These are great for vocals, leads and melodies. Think of an optical compressor where you want a smooth rounding out of the sound as opposed to a hard squash. Some examples of optical compressor plugins are the Waves CLA 2A and 3A and UAD's LA 2A and 3A. Plugin development has introduced all kinds of tweaks to the compressor formula. You've got plugins that have multiple types of compressors in one plugin. Uh, you've got plugins, you've got multiband compression. Uh, you've got compressors that introduce different types of compression that you can blend together. The options are endless and it can just spin your mind round and round. But the key is to understand the fundamentals of compression. It's the same for all of them. Ultimately, the differences are how the compressor handles the compression, uh, the types of controls that you have, and really whether or not you want something that's transparent or something that'll add some coloration. But it all starts with understanding the fundamentals of the compressor and you can build your knowledge from there. Well, I hope this video helps shine some light on compressors for you. Uh, there's, there are so many options and it can get a bit daunting, but uh, I hope I've made it simple enough that sort of give you a little step up in your knowledge of compressors. As always, I'm happy to answer questions. You can just throw them right in the comments and I'll do my best to, to answer your questions. Well, if you're new to the channel, I hope I've earned a subscribe. I've got a lot of videos on this channel geared to the home studio enthusiast and the home recording musician. So I hope you'll hit that subscribe button and come along for the ride. If you really want to support this channel, I am on Patreon. Links to everything I've discussed are in the description below. And above all else, I hope I'll see you again in another video. As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And please like, subscribe, and ring that bell to stay up to date. Remember, you don't need a band to rock and roll. There are a lot of great musical projects you can do by yourself, right from your own home. I hope to see you again next time.